Hello! Welcome to Vision and Hearing. Let's begin with a diagram of the human eye. The eye is said to have two optical components, the cornea and the lens. Here we see the cornea, and a little bit posterior to that we have the lens. Critically, the retina is going to be all the way in the back of the eye, and we'll be talking in a few minutes about the optic disc, which sets up a very interesting psychological phenomenon known as the blind spot. But here's the anatomy of the eye in broad stroke. If we zoom in, we can learn about image formation on the retina. Specifically, image formation on the retina depends on two components. First, the cornea. The cornea refracts or bends light. It changes the direction of light entering the eye. And we'll be talking about the refractive power of the cornea and also of the lens. The refractive power is really the bending power. Because the cornea is convex, it makes incoming light rays converge to a focal point. That's part of the focusing process. The refractive power of the cornea, or any other optical device, is measured in a unit called the diopter. And we happen to have about 40 diopters of refractive or bending strength in the cornea. So let's take a look at a diagram. A diopter would be equal to 1 over the focal length in meters. Focal length is the distance from the optical device that would be right here to the focal point. So if we pretend for the moment that this is your cornea and light is coming in this way, it's coming in from the left side, this will be a lens that's going to effectively refract or bend the light to some kind of a focusing point that we call the focal point. And the distance from here to here is the focal length. One over the focal length is a diopter. Image formation on the retina also depends on the crystalline lens, not just on the cornea. We have these two components that do the refraction or bending for us, and that helps to focus the light onto the retina. Unlike the cornea, an interesting property of the crystalline lens is that it can change shape, providing an additional optical power of between 10 to 30 diopters, depending on how much it is bent and its shape at the moment. This variability in the lens shape is called accommodation. Together, the cornea and the lens provide refraction that ranges from about 50 to 70 diopters, at least in healthy young eyes. As we get older, that number might change, but this is a good estimate for young adults. Let's now consider some of the refractive errors that can occur. One type of refractive error is said to be a myopic error, also known as myopia, and this is more commonly known as nearsightedness. To use an informal phrase, we can say that the eyeball is essentially too long, if you will, given the refractive power of the eye. So once again, light is coming in this way, and we'll pretend that this is either your cornea or your lens or some combination of the two. The retina of this particular eye is back here. Ideally, the incoming rays would be focused right onto the retina, not before it and not after it. It would land right on the retina. Here, we have essentially too much refractive power, and the eye is essentially too long given the refractive power. The focal point has landed before the retina. So we can correct this by putting a concave or negative lens here. And when we add a negative lens, we reduce the refractive power. So instead of bending the light so strongly and landing here, with a negative lens up front, we would bend the light or refract the light less strongly, and we could now get a better approximation of the focal point onto the retina, and that would correct this person's vision. The complementary condition is said to be hyperopic, or we speak of hyperopia. Informally, we call this farsightedness. In this case, the eyeball is, if you will, too short given the refractive power of the lens. As always, the light is coming in here. Here's our refractive device. We can think of that as either the cornea or the lens or the combination of those two. And you can see that we don't have quite enough power in our refraction. We are actually refracting the light to a focal point that is beyond the retina. So what we need to do is increase, in this case, the refractive power. And we do that with a corrective lens that is convex and said to be positive. We're increasing the refractive power so we can bend the light more strongly to appropriately land on the retina. Another type of refractive error is diagrammed here. We speak of the presbyopic eye, or we say old sight. That would be the translation from the Greek. It's caused by sclerosis or hardening of the crystalline lens. So you remember that this is the portion of our refractive devices that actually bend and can change from moment to moment. There's generally reduced refraction, and this means that we need some optical correction. 
Typically, we correct this using bifocals. For reading, we correct that with a relatively strong convex lens, and distance, we correct that with a typically weaker convex lens. Often this occurs in our 40s. We see the first signs, typically then, of old sight or presbyopia. Let's move now outside of refraction and talk about another interesting phenomena in vision, and this is a psychological phenomena called the blind spot. Here, we have the perceptual consequence that arises from an optic disc. This is the anatomical structure on the nasal side of each retina, and this is essentially a bundle of axons that carries information from the retina off to the rest of the visual system. It exits out of the eye, again on the nasal side, and there are no photoreceptors there, and because of this, we have a blind spot in each of our eyes near the nasal side. The photoreceptors themselves live in the retina, and these are the elements that actually do what we call transduction. Transduction is converting or transducing some form of environmental energy into action potentials, something that the nervous system can use. For our species, we typically have two varieties of photoreceptor. One is called the rod, and it's rod-shaped. Another is more cone-shaped and is appropriately called the cone. You might notice that these catch the light, which are coming in this way. In this diagram, the light is coming in this way, and the photoreceptors, somewhat counterintuitively, actually face away from the incoming light. After they catch the light, there's a small change in the shape of the photoreceptor, and that change actually sets up a release of glutamate that will kick off a chain reaction and make its way down a series of nerve fibers. Critically, although cones and rods are both photoreceptors, they differ from each other in important functional ways. Cones provide color vision, whereas rods don't. Rods tend to be exceptionally good at picking up very, very low levels of light. So, for example, at night, when there is very little light about, usually the cones are not operating in any impressive way. There might be some cone activity. By contrast, the rods are able to pick up very, very low levels of photons in the environment. So these have high sensitivity, but they provide no color. And by contrast, the cones are comparatively less sensitive, but they do in fact provide color vision. And we'll zoom in on that now. To understand how cones provide color vision, it's critical to realize that our species is said to be trichromatic. By trichromatic, we mean that we have three different photoreceptor types in the cones. We have a relatively long wave cone, a relatively medium wave cone, and a short wave cone. So let's see if we can unpack that on this graph. On the x-axis of this graph, we're speaking of the wavelength of light, and that's measured in nanometers. Humans typically can see a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, or the light spectrum, that ranges between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. Other animals might be able to see further into the infrared side over here, or further into the ultraviolet side over here. Now, we have three different varieties of cones, at least most humans do. And again, these are said to be short wave, medium wave, and long wave cones. These very, very crudely have sometimes been called the blue photoreceptor. And here we have this photoreceptor peaking in its relative sensitivity at maybe a little bit higher than 400, but not quite as high as 450 nanometers. Then we have the medium wavelength cone, and some people refer to that as the green cone, shown here in green, and that has a peak considerably to the right of the short wave cone. And then finally, we have the long wave cone, which is shown here in red. Some people crudely refer to that as the red photoreceptor. In a more advanced class, we can articulate why it's really not a good idea to call these the blue, green, and red cones, but informally, many people do use that. So if you hear that terminology, that's what they're referring to, the blue, green, and red cones, respectively corresponding to those cones that are maximally sensitive to relatively shorter wavelengths, or relatively more medium wavelengths, or to the longest wavelengths. These three cone types make up our trichromatic vision. Okay, here we have a diagram of different cranial nerves. These are essentially axon bundles that carry information from one area of the brain to another area of the brain. The one that we want to focus on now is cranial nerve number two. This is the optic nerve. So after the eyes have transduced the light in the retina, they will send a message out of the optic nerve. Specifically, it will go out through the optic disc, which creates a blind spot for us, and make its way off to a thalamus, 
and then all the way back to the occipital lobe back here. In this diagram, the eyes are up here. We're looking at the brain from the bottom. So interestingly, although this is the right side of our picture, this would be the left side of this patient. This is the left side of our picture. This would be the right side of this patient. And here's an optic nerve, and of course they come in pairs. So here's an optic nerve also. Let's now talk about the optic inversion. This is an interesting phenomenon that comes to us directly from physics. It's not biology, it's not psychology, it's actually a physical property of light. And it's quite straightforward. Here are simple mantras. Left goes to right, and right goes to left. Can you say that with me? Left goes to right, and right goes to left. Now let's just add a little bit more information on that. What we mean by this is that the left visual field projects to the right side of each retina. And conversely, the right visual field projects to the left side of each retina. Now let's take an example. If you'll focus with me on my cursor, I'm putting my cursor right about here, maybe you can focus even on these quotation marks. While you're focusing there, the O in the word optic is on your left side, so it's actually going to wind up into your right cortex, and it's also going to be projecting to the right side of each retina. Conversely, if you keep your eye right here, there's an N in the word inversion at the end. That last N, if you keep your fixation right here, is going to project, because it's on the right side of the visual field, it's going to project to the left side of each retina and eventually make its way back to your left visual cortex. So left goes to right, right goes to left. This is the optic inversion. The optic inversion similarly holds for the top and bottom or vertical axis. Top goes to bottom, bottom goes to top. Can you say that with me? Top goes to bottom, bottom goes to top. There you go. So we'll unpack that. The upper visual field projects to the lower portion of each retina, and conversely, the lower visual field projects to the upper portion of each retina. So if we're focusing here one more time, something that's all the way down here is going to be projecting to a relatively upper portion of each retina, and something that's way up here is going to be projecting to a lower portion of each retina. Okay, so this slide is extremely busy. Please stay with me. We'll see if we can make our way on through. The main ideas are that the left visual field is here, the right visual field is here. For the moment, please ignore this large oval. It's very colorful, we'll come back to it. Please ignore this large oval. The main idea is that the left visual field is going to project to the right side of each retina. Here's the right side of the left eye. Here's the right side of the right eye. And those projections are going to make their way all the way back into the right visual cortex. So essentially what we have going on here is the left visual field will be represented contralaterally into the right visual cortex. Over here we have the right visual field. Again, for the moment, please ignore these ovals. The right visual field will project to the left side of each retina, and they will eventually make their way to the left visual cortex, as you see here. And along the way, they're going to be moving along the optic nerve, as we saw, that's the second cranial nerve. They're also passing through a structure called the lateral geniculate nucleus. Here's the left lateral geniculate nucleus. Here's the right lateral geniculate nucleus. And what will be happening here is a relay, a simple relay all the way back to the cortex. The LGN, or lateral geniculate nucleus, is a portion of the thalamus. And the thalamus plays an important relay role. It also provides some information, but its main job is to relay to the appropriate portion of the cortex the incoming information. Now, we could go through and unpack all the different colors and what's projecting to what in each eye, but in the interest of time and expediency, we'll skip that. We'll just stay with the general idea that left visual field is going to wind up on the right side, and right visual field is going to project to the left side. Okay, with that as a summary of our visual system, let's now understand a little bit about a different sense. This is the hearing sense, the sense of audition. Let's first get an idea for what's going on in the stimulus for hearing. Out there in the real world, there's all kinds of sounds coming our way. In fact, my voice is creating a sound for you now. And what's very interesting about this is that sound travels in what we call a longitudinal wave. In a longitudinal wave, the local perturbations, as you see right here with my cursor, the local perturbations are running parallel to the overall propagation of the wave. And what we mean by that is you can see that we have a domino effect coming from the left to the right locally, and it's creating this overall wave pattern that's moving from left to right. And that's called a longitudinal wave. Here we're showing a simple linear case, but in actual sound, it might be something more like this. If we were to 
plop a rock into a pond, you would get this kind of a ripple effect moving out. And this would be very much akin to a sound wave, where neighboring molecules are compressing and decompressing in such a way that they create these waves that might be occurring at relatively fast rates or slower rates, and they might be occurring at different intensities. So let's see if we can understand some of these different properties. The loudness of a sound, okay, we can talk about loudness as the psychological correlate of acoustic energy, and this is measured in decibels. Another important property is the pitch of a sound, the psychological correlate of frequency measured in hertz or cycles per second. So you can imagine that we can have a peak and a trough in compressed air and rarefied air 10 times per second or 100 times per second or 1,000 times per second. These are all different cycles per second. And that's a different property. That's its frequency. That's a different property from its amplitude, which is an indication of how loud it is. So we have loudness and we have pitch. We also have the capacity, as humans, to localize sounds. And we have two tricks for localizing sounds. We can tell where the sounds are coming from, in part because of interaural intensity differences. When we say interaural, we're talking about the difference between the ears. So acoustic energy is greater at the ear nearest to the distal stimulus. Let's pretend that you're here, and a sound is coming in from this direction. The sound is going to hit this ear before it hits that ear. And when it hits this ear, it'll be ever so slightly louder than this ear because sound tends to dissipate. It becomes less intense as it moves through space. It's initially at its greatest amplitude or greatest intensity at the starting point, and then it fades as it moves through. So we'll get a slightly louder intensity here than we will here if the sound is coming from this side. That's one of the tricks that we can use to localize sounds. There's another trick as well. It's called an interaural time difference. And again, interaural refers to between the ears. So there is now a time difference between the ears. Again, if a sound is coming from this side, this would be your left side as you're looking at the screen, it would hit the left ear first, and ever so slightly later, it's going to hit the right ear. It turns out that your nervous system is actually sensitive to those two different times of arrival, the left side and the right side. Acoustic energy arrives first at the ear nearest the distal stimulus. So, because of these timing and intensity differences, we can localize sounds. Let's now go and try to understand a little bit about how the ear is constructed. So here, in the outer portion, we have the pinna. This is what you and I can see on a regular basis as we look at people coming toward us or even as we are behind them. Sound will come in to this external auditory canal and begin pounding on the tympanic membrane. This can be called more informally your eardrum. And there's a pattern of vibrations that will or set into oscillation a series of ossicles. These are the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. These are the three smallest bones in the human body. Malleus, incus, and stapes, sometimes informally called the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. And these will set up a lever system that actually begin banging on this structure, which is the cochlea, the malleus, incus, and stapes are in an air-filled chamber. And then here, the cochlea, we have a fluid-filled chamber. So we begin banging on this fluid-filled chamber, and that will set up some vibrations that actually release some neurotransmitters and set up some action potentials that move down the cochlear nerve. This is the eighth cranial nerve, and this will send a signal off to the thalamus, which in turn will relay it to the auditory cortex. We can now revisit our pairs of cranial nerves and we can look here, this time, not at nerve number two, which was for vision, the optic nerve. We now have the auditory nerve as the eighth cranial nerve. And this is what's going to be the bundle of neurons that's taking the information from the cochlea off to eventually the temporal cortex, which specializes in hearing. Thanks for watching.